Hello, everyone. So my name is Catherine de Wolf. I'm Assistant Professor of Circular Engineering for Architecture. And today, it's really my pleasure to host Professor Hanif Kara for the Impact Lecture Series. He's renowned as a creative driving force at the intersection of design and engineering. To introduce Hanif, I have to say that he has really multiple hats that he's wearing. First, he's a teacher. Currently, he's a professor at Harvard at the Graduate School of Design, the GSD. He was previously also a professor at KTH in Stockholm in Sweden, and he continues to teach internationally. Second, he's a design director of the 25-year-old engineering practice Act 2 in London, where he leads the firm's 350 designers and technicians. Third, he is recognized by many as a sharp entrepreneur and businessman, selling and buying back his practice. Next to this, he's also serving the board of trustees of the Architecture Foundation, He's a member of the design group for National Infrastructure Commission of the UK. He's an advisor for the Alvaro Siza Foundation and a steering committee member for the Glasgow School of Arts Macintosh Rebuilding Program. Hanif is a fellow at the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Royal Institute of British Architects and the Royal Society of Arts. He wrote also several insightful books such as Interdisciplinary Design, Design Engineering Refocused and The Architecture and Waste, A Replant of Solacence. So his multiple hats can also be seen in parallel with the, with the three phases actually of the NCCR and digital fabrication. The first phase was really the time of exploration and that's what he's doing as a teacher. The second phase was really the time of implementation which is what he does as a structural engineer. And the third phase is the time of really bringing the technology out there in the real world which is what he does as an entrepreneur. So his works and his books really inspire and impact all of us. And I'm extremely happy to welcome Hanif Kara to present to us the thickness of impacts. Thank you very much, Hanif. Thank you. Um, shall we share the screen first? Okay. You can see my screen, right? Yes. Do you want to see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, first, all of you, Russell in particular, um, thanks so much for inviting me. Uh, it, you know, I, I've been doing this for too long, but this is quite unusual um, in the sense that it's with people that I admire and respect enormously. Um, I wish I was as young as you all are and had the opportunity to study with you. So, from that perspective. Um, I had to step back and think about this. Otherwise, I just do these lectures off the top of my head. I've, I've got so much in there through experience. So when you talk about impact, I my first kind of step back was, how do I make sense? Because in many ways, uh, with those three hats, but more importantly, looking at it from where you're looking at it, which is in a very advanced position, in, in the world of engineering, how do I make any sense? So at the core of it, I thought the best way to do it would be to use the old thing that we as a practice have conjuncted the word design and engineering, using design as a verb in this sense. And we're very careful uh, in that space in, in terms of what it actually means, but it is now 25 years of it. So I think we are not only believing in, in this, term and this meta kind of concept. It's not new, but certainly it has a particularity from our perspective in, in the work we do and the way we behave that I think would make sense. And then the second thing was, in some ways, we as engineers make very little impact um, if you really step back and look. So I thought, well, if I was to use a meta idea and then think about how thick or thin the different bits are, because impact itself is, is not a cohesive singular thing, as you all know, and you know that it can mean so many different things. So one of the things I think engineers should be good at is narrowing it down to the slices that they can actually impact and, and understand, and then replaying that back so that we're all able to then take from it or crit be critical of it, whichever. So with that, I thought that the way I would do it was really split it or, or go through a very fast excursion through five ideas or five themes. 
that I feel uh, we as a practice um, and the, the things that uh, Catherine said have probably had a, a kind of minor impact. In the world of engineering, 25 years is, is nursery school, as you all probably know. But nonetheless, in the area of practice, in the area of what we've constructed, in the area of how we might have impacted the raw discipline, and what we might define as self-funded research, we've had um, sufficient impact to want to redefine it for ourselves yet again after 25 years. Uh, and then the, the new kind of uh, model, which has always been there in the background, but is now being presented to all of us, the ethics and morals of what we do. So under those themes, I thought I would start very quickly, as I said, it'll be touchstones and, and a kind of uh, excursion through what I think may make sense uh, in terms of the impact on ecology, on um, economy, and the socioeconomic impact, which combines the two. The practice itself um, and, and the impact it has had, I think, has been since the beginning trying to redefine the profession in many ways, um, because we were all, you know, we're brought up around a particular course of education, a particular definition of what a structural engineer does. And we've been very uh, impactful, I think, in trying to redefine that, not pretending that there is no history and no future, but rather agreeing that there is a very deep past and a very near future that we could actually engage in. And fortunately for us, the pandemic gave us all that particular moment that most of us wouldn't see. You know, you saw the past and, and the, the potential future overnight. So I think redefining of the, of the engineering has to come, first of all, from a scale of practice or designing the practice in itself to do the things that I'm gonna show you. The only two things I want to tell you is we're 25 years old and we're 360 people and we're based in London. And then the rest I'll fit in. So which lens uh, does the design engineer speak from? Um, which I think is quite important in my particular definition of it has been, and I think many of you have heard me say it when, I, when I'm fortunate enough to be in your company over there is this idea of not overstepping so that I don't, or we don't as a, as a design engineer become the architect. Um, I know that it's a common cliche, but we specifically defined our practice to the position where it makes all our collaborators, and on, in this instance to the left, I've put the architect, look better than they are. They're all very good people, but our input is to know when we are not needed, how far can we push our discipline, but then when do we let them actually become what it is they feel their discipline is. And it can be whoever that is. And that's partly been born out of uh, noticing um, the dilemma of the postmodern and modern issues that we've had. It's, it's been going on since enlightenment, the, the argument between art and science, but certainly been abused more and more in the last 100 years and the digital made it worse over the last 25 years in some respects but from what you the work you do there's a way of making it better so on the right i'm quite um provocative about all these thin slicing of what i think engineers and architects do largely but then it's been thin sliced for, for particularities particular reasons and giving away the discipline the second thing that we tried to define early was this idea of what it means in practice to do um, a process. And for the benefit of just the conversation, I think you should be aware, you will be aware, most of you, that we have to work this cascading um, concept right throughout the world, wherever you are. The process from design to construction, is it cascades. It's not it's very linear and you go one step down, down, down until you start delivering the building. Well, we all know, particularly the, the people who are digitally savvy, that that is completely the opposite of what the digital allows us. So the process has been redefined in, non, in a non-linear form and I will explain that. And the reason why I thought I would do that is partly to um, explain what I mean by how little, how much impact we can have, but also to, to just uh, narrow it down to 
the limited amount of research we can do from practice. It is very, a very small amount because we do it largely from self-funding. The, the point here is really that all of the work we do is, is pretty insignificant compared to what the client faces. So all that design work and construction information, largely speaking, our clients are in a loss from the moment they appoint us for a, quite a long time until the building is occupied or the city is fully functioning or the train is working, whatever it is we're working on. And his benefits come way down the line. And over time, he, he basically gets the value out of that initial work. So in some ways, we can have very little impact on everything is to the right, to the right of that point where his negativity turns into a positive value. Because that's the moment that is probably about 20 to 25 years in most of the projects we do, largely speaking, because there's there are of, of a larger scale. So one issue is really how do you be, you know, kind of if you talk to clients, if you talk to constructors, they are dismissive because of that first diagram I showed, the prism. They think they can take one of those slices and actually reduce. The, the losses and reduce the way they would make something or hire it or imagine it. And one of our goals has been to move the bell curve, which is the, the blue curve, to the left a bit more in our work by investing very early in design to prove to them that that moment eventually results in extreme value. So we're really quite confident about making value for people. And I think this is the value for our clients, value for our staff, and value for those people who will use our buildings. This is quite a significant uh, position to, to start from. So if I give you a quick example of what it actually means in real work terms, if you look at a project like the Serpentine Pavilion, which most of you would recognize um, as taking an old form, you know, a, a, a diced um, idea, but actually blowing it up into a modern material and reimagining the, the idea of what a wall can do when you open it as, at a conceptual scale, it becomes a pavilion, but also applying new materials to it. So if we're doing something like this, which took um, from the moment we won the competition to construction, finishing eight weeks. So it's real pace from not knowing without the process that I described, the nonlinear process, which goes from that thought to production to construction, and without the digital, there is no way those kind of projects could have been done. So we build our own quite crude models, numerical models, but also uh, interoperable mo models that allow one piece of software to work with another and so on. This is not easy to do, but it's something that has developed over time in the office. So we'll, when we're, we weren't sure whether the material we wanted to use, which was a um, glass fiber reinforced plastic sheet material, whether when we make the bricks the size of coffins, where, what would they do? You know, would they work? But in the meantime, we also had to order the plastic. And in the meantime, we also had to think about production information. So all of these things can be collapsed with the power of the digital. So we were making it at the time when we were still analyzing it. And you can kind of understand, I've got lots of charts to show you about the fact which moment we actually were sure it was going to work. I think we'd built about 40% of it. So one of the things that this kind of a project allows is what I described as self-funded research and an investment um, using the digital to demonstrate to the world, but also demonstrate to others collaboratively uh, how we work. And, and to do this, you, you will know, but I would say it anyway, it was Copenhagen big, um, New York big, and AKT London. So we're across times, so it's, it's 24 hour clock, and you have to then be communicating while one person goes to sleep and so on. So in, in a sense, most of this would not be possible or feasible. The two things that make it feasible is having that curiosity to try and demonstrate the, the potential of this kind of tool. Then you've got to take it, uh, what is the investment worth? And, and you look carefully and you think to yourself, well, why would AKT do it? Well, it's not just for showing off. It's not just to prove a piece of research, but it's also commercially viable because 
that's the tools we developed then took us to Google Mountain View, which just for scale is 750 feet wide. So it's 20 to 25 times the size of the Serpentine Pavilion. So we can scale up very fast and scale down again and work at that speed with that optimization and that kind of level of interest when we're inverting the idea of the god Buckminster Fuller, which is the kind of modern way of thinking about shells. And we, we invented that for this particular project um, in an international competition. So you can see that without having that familiarity with the tools and having the familiarity with the colleagues that we work with, it's difficult to be able to produce something as imaginative like this and then follow on to deliver. So that's the first kind of um, touchstone, which is practice and how does that turn into something else and how does it turn into something without losing our houses and shirts. You know, we do get paid for this stuff. The second thing is really um, the touchstone on construction very quickly. Again, I, I just wanted to pop three things here very quickly for you. So you, you get a feeling of what is possible and feasible. So the pop-up cities opportunities around the Olympics or Biennales uh, and so on is one target that we have set ourselves almost 25 years ago. And we've been involved in many in the UK pavilion. I think we did UK Olympics. We did about 18 to 20 of the buildings, different scale, different size. And that pop-upness is a bit like the serpentine where you get a moment to invent because the one thing that is sure, it has to open on a certain day. So the usual obstructions of construction and the usual procurement rules and the camaraderie or, or uh, uh, let's call it misbehavior that goes on in construction disappears because you all have one goal, which is to open on that day and, and make it special. So you get an opportunity then to do in that kind of environment some of the work that um, we go on to do, let's say. Equally, you need to be thinking of, particularly in, based in London, Western Europe, and I'm gonna come back to that, all the buildings that are being built, the new ones, and not just buildings, but locales. So here, King's Cross, we have been involved in it for 20 years. So as a slow burn process, as technology has moved, but also as, um, markets change as as construction change some contractors go bust and so on you have to trace all that as part of your invention and work and it can only happen when you construct stuff so we have a significant impact on what happens i believe during construction and and also in the direction construction goes in in this particular project there are examples where we wouldn't do something today that we did 15 or 20 years ago, and we can show it to you on the building, you know. So slow burn is important. The third one, obvious one, um, the towers and bridges would always come in when structural, structural engineers talk about it, is, is the tower. And obviously we have, like everybody else, you know, had our fair share of reinventing this type uh, across geographies and across climates. But it's not... Um, worth spending a lot of time talking about one particular one. I thought what I'd do is actually show you the, 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 the kind of sharpening of the practice that allowed us to do something like this, which if it was a tower, this is the Bloomberg headquarters, which currently is, touches many of the, the, the bases you are, you are all thinking about, ecology, construction, um, new technologies, and so on. It's currently the greenest office space in the world, not by one measure, but by all of the world's measures. And it, it required an invention and a, a, a promise or even a, an ambition from both the client and the architect to respond against one other's, one other's challenge. You know, the architect here, Norman Foster, Bloomberg, wanting some legacy in central London at a very premier site and wanted to invent the building of the future, the first target for that was not only a legacy, what would it look like in 100 years, because it's right behind St. Paul's, but also the climate. And don't forget this opened three years ago, and I think four years ago, we got the Sterling Prize on it, but it took nine years from conceiving to finishing it. And what do we go through? How do we change construction systems? And what happened? To, what was the benefits of having the digital? 
I can take it piece by piece, you know, from the facade that will move when the quality of air improves in London. So it's designed a bespoke system. Two, I, I can take you inside and show you some of the, you know, amazing geometry that we had to set up in 3D space inside the ramps and the fabrication tolerances of one millimeter on site. But I thought that the, 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 for the purposes of today, I would just refer you to the binding of that, the binding of the micro through the tools, and also a premier project where the target is set and you, like the Olympics, you cannot fail. But what do you run into in construction? And that's the bit that I think you can't be taught. It's not something that comes from university or you know how much we think. And you learn. So we have, it was the project in London that um, generated what is called Rufus, which many of you might know about, the reuse of foundations. Because when we arrived on site, there were piles from the past hundred years of archaeology from engineers. So all the red piles and the blue piles we found on site. So the form and all of its architecture was really already um, in great problem because the technology below the ground, as it was slowly developing from under rim piles to straight shaft piles, had killed the site. This is a phenomenon that is common now. We're doing one in Paris and one in Berlin, having done this one, where we are looking below the ground to see what it is we can, uh, particularly in a climate emergency, and I'll come back to it, what it is that can be done in the things you can't see. What can the, the pure structural engineer with his design hat on, how can he push this? So all we did here was really the red piles, um, which are very few. Um, we found the Roman London under here, and there's a bigger story, but we used and developed enough soil structure interaction models, which those of you who understand that will know is a very different situation in a confined soil in London in particular that's been piled three times. But we, we reused it, um, taking advantage of the existing piles, which is quite difficult with an insurance. At another scale in construction, we can dream all day and we have the technology. So algorithms can ha have an impact. And we won an international competition a few years ago in the early days, I guess, um, with an algorithm with George Legendre as the architect for a competition to build a bridge in Singapore, which is 300 meters long, drops by 40 meters and needs to curve. So he's making three moves in parallel, which all of you will understand can be done mathematically. And this was our competition entry. This was the drawing that won the project. Today, it looks banal, but I can tell you that at the time, it was the thing that pushed us beyond the 500 entries to win in that environment. And obviously has since been built and you can sort of connect it to mathematics beyond that to the tools that you are all now using. The third uh, group would be the discipline rather than the practice. What is it uh, that we've had to do with the discipline itself, which I separate from the profession and the practice. Largely, I would say, if I was giving you one phrase, that we've had to sacrifice a lot of conventions in the discipline, such as, um, you know, we're perceived to be binary, we're perceived to be purists, finding the thinnest piece of glass or the longest bridge. How far can, how small can we make the column? We've kind of sacrificed quite a lot of that. We don't really care about that kind of conversations, rightly or wrongly. We're interested in much deeper and broader idea of design. And, in that sense, um, the other aspect I would say about us has been that we've not been afraid to naively share our secrets without knowing what might happen or what might not happen. So we're quite able and capable of not publishing in the techno techno technology magazines where only professors publish and only other professors read. So what we tend to do is actually publish anything anywhere until somebody might actually listen. And that's been going on over time. Speeding that up in terms of the discipline, the bits that would interest you the most, I guess, is the tools. So in-house, as, as most of you will know, we have quite a, a, an incredible office, which is continually um, trying to make our job easier. Although we are structural engineers, all of the, the fast forward tools I just showed you are built in-house because some of our projects 
we could not wait for the architect or the constructor or the client to ask those questions. We just knew that one day in this particular project, if we didn't do a light analysis, the light would shine, a car would crash from the sun's reflection, we would be in trouble. The architect was not capable of doing that. The client could not frame that question in his head until we presented to them what is the potential of doing this kind of project. This is Birmingham New Street Station with Foreign Office Architects. The other impact, which I call obviousness, um, and it is something that we talked about when I was last on Zoom with you guys, you know, it's, it's become the fashion, the big drama, retrofit, don't build anything as if it's new. Um, those of you who are experts in this field will know it's been going on. It predates man, to be honest, the idea of reusing something and reconstructing. But what's important about it is, you know, as a practice, we were fortunate enough to spot that opportunity very early to create the practice and, and partly informed by the ideas of sustainability, but partly informed by the knowledge or smart knowledge that if we're gonna be based in the UK, in London, the left-hand diagram tells you that most of the uh, groups of uh, countries and places where we are working are already built. They don't need new buildings. So largely speaking, we targeted both the idea of new build, but also what can we do with the existing stock over time. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the new build opportunities really um, sorry, on, on the left-hand side of the top are coming from China and, and limited number of uh, places and they're disproportionately so. So this idea of obviousness and not being uh, afraid of talking about it as though it is not a new invention. Let us not have a conference on retrofit, please. You know, this is kind of the way we speak about it at work. It's just something we should all be able to do and don't hijack the term for your own um, kind of use or misuse of it. So in that, I, I wanted to zoom in very quickly to the whole problem that I know Robert is very interested in with concrete. And we're currently working quite a lot, like everyone else, um, how can we find um, you know, a, a less problematic situation for concrete in 15 or so years from now? It's obviously the devil right now. It's giving us all a nightmare and we're beginning to recognize its problems. But we have accepted that, you know, you cannot imagine a world without it. So what are we going to help people do? Uh, how, how are we going to start working on it right now while the research goes on? And, and that kind of work has really forced us to push ourselves fast and faster to a point where we're making our own simple tools for the simple idea of not mono material, but taking the building, not, not an element of the building as, as a material, but the building as a material which we work, have to work with. And then giving our engineers the tool very quickly to be able to look at the embodied energy, the carbon footprint, because we are going to hit the targets for 2030 in the UK, apparently. So what are, what are the tools we can use to get get the engineers fast. The discipline and the codes don't always allow this. And it's not something the client particularly wants to pay for. But unless you reinvest in doing this, you probably won't survive as a structural engineer. So we're doing this and I particularly use envelope and, and I know some of you are doing that and the, uh, the stuff below ground because that's where I believe right now, AKT have broke some new ground. What's going on underneath? And how can we deal better with foundations? And what can we do to not keep building more piles? To the point where in real time, about a month ago, we put the first piles. So this is British land, the biggest developer in the UK. We had this kind of presentation about two years ago. And they said, well, you're the idiots that will probably achieve this. So let's keep working on this. And we have put down our first EFC piles for a real development in Canada water. It's a first, and you can see the, the benefit of reducing GCBS, but forget that, because we all know that where that comes from sometimes, if it's not electric arc, and go further than that, where can, what can we do with the substructure to begin with? 
in order to reduce the, the carbon footprint whilst people are trying to invent. And this, this is a, 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 a test pile now in, we're measuring its behavior right now, all funded thankfully by the client, but we had to push them to this level to jump across you know, from 100% OPC right down to an 81% reduction, which if, if we don't fail, I think we won't. If we don't fail, because the answer is to make some more redundancy on site. If we do fail, just add more piles. But the situation here is that we are likely to succeed and the, the, the change in the discipline is going to follow very fast. And equally, when it comes to towers, you know, I, I wanted to show you just one example. Is probably about seven years ago, there was a competition in London to amongst engineers. Uh, the client only invited en engineers. And he said, um, this is a tower on the left by Seafoot and Arab. Five invited engineers. The person that could make it the tallest and fastest building will win the competition. And we did. We, we added 13 floors to a 26 floor building uh, in our first entry. We actually ended up putting more than that. What was interesting is uh, the, why I call it new legacy is that we respect Arabs a lot and they've done the original building. And partly because of that, I think they didn't take the risks we took in terms of re-engineering the concrete from the 60s and taking some risks on materials gaining strength looking carefully at how we can add on top of it and therefore saved three to four years in planning, forget the embodied energy um, question for a second, but really deliver it to the market whilst the market is high. And we are now on, a, on fifth one of these. So suddenly it's become the new trend. Uh, AKT have got five of these going on that are all towers that we're just adding to. And we're looking at potentially 17 of these um, handing them over to Vancouver because engineers over there got quite interested when we were doing this. So we've shared the way in which we would propose that they do it. Um, the, the second last touchstone would be what I would describe as, as um, our research, and it's not as high end as yours, but the main slogan out of that is how can we close the gap faster between what you might call research and what is um, delivered to the public. And it doesn't always come um, unless you force the issue. So for those of you who are familiar with Mazda, we were involved from my GSD hat, but also MIT were involved and a lot of people in the zero carbon city. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be introduced to that bold client during a research phase. And then we went on to win the first neighborhood with Foster and Partners. And that, that particular project relied heavily on the history of Yemen and all those towers um, that you see that are up to 4,000 years old in some cases. And what was the way in which they built these things? What was it that allowed them to live in these? But also how can passive cooling and passive um, air be modernized? How can we try and take some of the lessons from there back into the new neighborhood? Despite what the press says about this, I think the client was bold, brave, and the, the, the paradox of trying to build a zero carbon city in itself is a, it is, is a twisted question, but nonetheless, the first neighborhood was delivered. And, and the waste book that Catherine showed was partly uh, going on, because I was already thinking about four years of research on what we can do with zero waste and waste in general. So on that project, just so you're aware, it's old now, we achieved zero waste. We recycled almost everything that we left from the site and did many other things to make it sustainable. But for me, the, the probably most important thing was the post-occupancy triumph that came out of it. When we measured, when we went back post-occupancy, um, Foster's basically invested in the tools to measure how the, the, the neighborhood is behaving. And there was a significant difference in temperature at, at the same time in a similar place nearby with the wide idea of big streets from the USA being put in this, in, in this part of the world. And if you can imagine per degree change, how much impact that would have had on the whole city. 
So that forensic bit where we had the triumph in the end, really, of proving that you should continue this city in this manner and setting that prototype up was probably the most interesting part. Of course, those things also allow us to be parasitical in, in incidental rewards arrive in that when we did that project, the, the local government also had a, a protected mud um, fort, which they appointed us with uh, Michele Silvetti architects from Boston to refurbish and rebuild. So you get an incidental reward because of the way in which you are projecting your research being delivered into reality. And when the audience is right, you get an incidental reward that you might not have predicted. But it, it was also um, the moment when I was seeking real um, questions about the specific point of waste, kitchen waste, because I'd been looking at infrastructure and how architecture and design is largely um, uh, removed from that agenda. And, and with Biake Ingos and a number of others, we were already talking about what we could do. And I did a four year piece of work basically that compared Sweden with the USA or in a one area where it's you know 80% landfill and the other way is zero and try to really push that what I would call design research back into the role of architects and how could we make the building so it's the new cathedral or the new church or the new uses that it can have that ultimately do what this power station has done increase the value of the house next to it rather than nobody wants to live next to a waste station that's effectively what's happened here, which is quite a, a gain economically, but also it washes quite a lot of, it's not the most sustainable way to get rid of waste, but it was done through this piece of research and the book. That um, isn't all. We have taken some risks in the last couple of years to see what else we can get involved in. And in the Sarge Triano uh, with cooking sections, we felt that the role of the architect is changing. And, you know, there are new younger generations that are completely different about the way they're thinking about architecture. They're, they are more protective of the, the, the next generation. They're more, they want to protect other species. And with cooking sections, uh, with Adrian Lahoud um, curating this, we won the, the small garden where we wanted to grow desert plants without water, which was the idea that this new architect had. Um, and they've built this, you probably know of cooking sections that we call them the salmon kids now because it's so famous for um, identifying the problems with salmon farming. But this is, this is live. So we put enough devices, um, enough sensors in here to measure over time. If you look at it on Google Earth right now, it's grown quite a lot. So we're measuring uh, from the way in which we modeled the, with the bioclimatic tool, the way in which we modeled the form of the land, also the gardens and how people might use, use it. We're able to now look back and say, yes, we can actually tackle topology and topography in a way that allows a new way of thinking about how to, how to recreate desert plants, for example. And the tools that we've used, there are so many sensors around this thing. Equally, um, in terms of research, I, I do every two years a studio for the last 12 years at, at GSD. And the one thing I always do is I rarely, despite the pressure, I've never done it on my own. I always have to have a core driver, which is part of this idea, what does collaboration mean? And does two plus two equal five or not? So it's always within an architect or another designer well, my role is as a design engineer. So with CLT, Jennifer Bonner and I did a couple of years ago, challenge the whole idea of where this is going. Um, in the long shadow of modernism, it, is, it, it kind of got us at one level to a point where it's questioning modernism. But on the other hand, um, we published a book on it, which will come out fairly soon. We were able to show that if you leave this in the hands of researchers and the industry, you're likely to use it less. If you give artists, architects, and others a chance to integrate this early on and don't make it a special CLT architect or a special CLT engineer's work, then you have a better chance. So our material research 
scales in and out. It challenges narratives on modernism or the way in which an engineer and architect works, but it also looks at the material in depth, even in those option studios. And never without a purpose. So we built the Maggie Center with Thomas Heatherwick using this with all sorts of mass timber. It's a health building. And currently the largest um, CLT floor, which is on steel plates, on steel columns, uh, sorry, steel beams, in, this is going to be the largest steel floor in the whole of Europe. So we're going through right now the construction of that very, very fast. But it's been like a serpentine. We've had to run vibration studies in parallel because it's got, that's one of its weaknesses. So you can see the connection between what I call research, practice and invention kind of being born all at the same time. Nothing new, but trying to push it. Right now, um, I think we're investing right at this moment quite heavily in the, in the digital artisanal because we think we are at the post, um, post parametric era now, uh, and in many ways post digital. So what is the, the risks we're, we're going to take? Where are we gonna learn and sharpen ourselves from? And it is this, the, the, the digital natives as they go into art, I think we, we will find ourselves more engaged. So going back now and finishing on ethics and morals, how do we balance the universe of question? as engineers, you know, because you can run away and, and pretend you will work anywhere in the world and do anything, whether it's green or not. Well, one of the things we did early on is define the value system of the practice. And by that, I mean, there is a, a kind of de designed version. Um, this is the profile of the office. Majority of the work is done by the digital natives. And there's a rotating kind of uh, model of this, but over 25 years, I think our average age has been between seven, uh, to 27 and 33 is the worst. And I think I've made it 33 by just being the oldest guy in the office. So in a sense, we've kind of reached a moment where it needs to transform and try and also equally the yellow line, try and balance the, the gender issue. So value systems is one way we try to deal with equitability, for example. The other is the obvious, um, you know, let's call it epistemological, where we have to be very fortunate. And in London, you can have this as your footprint. This is the um, diversity that we have regularly run with. We have 44 to 50 nationalities on average in the office right throughout the time when we were 20 people to right now. So it's kind of grown and, and, and embedded in the practice. And that's partly to do with being in the right place, I think, because London does allow it. The other thing that I feel I wanted to mention was a thoughtful um, harvest that we, we engage in, which is to do with how do we connect with the third parties, not only our developer and our client, but the industry, the people who are influencing the industry. And this has been significant, not just education, but all the industry like British Council for Offices continual embedment in all of the, the way in which they think and the way which we engage with them in order to help them rethink certain things. And of that, probably the most rewarding for me and specifically to do with sustainability is I've been uh, almost 20, yeah, 20 years, you know, with the Aga Khan Award for Architecture at different levels, including the steering committee for the last two sessions. And where, what I've learned and much of what I've said, I've seen, so I've seen it through this 40 year um, lens of the Arkhan Award for architecture, architecture that combines many of the things I talked about. So I think that harvesting from the industry is part of the, the way in which we are, we feel we are responding to some of the moral and ethical positions. That does not avoid the serious questions where we have been asked and we've been criticized for building Baku on the left. And uh, when Morocco opens at the end of this year, we'll be criticized for doing the building on the right. But I think they are necessary triumphs because it's so easy to say that uh, if those countries want sim something symbolic and, and something that represents a, a post-colonial narrative, why wouldn't we do it? Even if it means that we could be criticized. So we will export and we do work in these parts of the world and we won't make it out of mud just because it's in Morocco. 
or in Baku, we will make it out of what we think the client and the architect needs and wants. And quite often these are triumphs because some of our technology testing goes on faster, quicker, has higher risks in these places than it does elsewhere. So we're very importantly um, or, or interested in this part of it. Um, the concluding comment to make really, and with some slogans that I've used often, um, there is a growing hegemony and there is a tunnel vision and we see it in our own office where we're all looking at the screen and we have all the software. Um, that hegemony of science has its problems. And this is where the moral and ethical debates are now being raised by the third generation of AKT. And I've used these slogans in different forms and, and I've done lectures on the whole issue of binary and without a soul. That's what technology is. It absolves um, truth and moral responsibility if you want it to. It removes agency accountability and creativity. Tools are not innocent. So be careful about how you use them. Pervasive and analytics, as you've seen from this lecture, can create a dysfunctionality. And people will act on those analytics at times because they're beautifully presented, but can be actually quite misplaced. It's quite interesting how many times I've shown an FE analysis in a competition that belongs to a project in Saudi in the middle of London and nobody else would know. So that's the end of my, my impact conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hanif. Uh, this was a very, very inspiring talk and, and really insightful lessons that we learned from this talk. And um, I would just want to tell the audience that I'm going to move now to the interview part, the interview format of this talk, and then I'll open the floor for questions later on. We're running a bit over time. Sorry. Um, so uh, initially, we wanted to call this 25 years in 25 minutes, but uh, it's too much to to share in only 25 minutes. So um, so we're going to uh, run a bit over time. So uh, I encourage everyone to stay if they can. Uh, and so uh, I'll start with some questions. Thank you so much, Hanif. Um, so one of the slides uh, was mentioning that Act 2 uh, has 350 designers and technicians that collectively really um, offer 50 cultural backgrounds and 30 languages, and you showed the diversity in Act 2. Uh, could you tell us a bit more about how this um, impacted your successes in practice? Uh, in, in, in direct terms, uh, if I was being very open, the recruitment strategies of finding engineers from Italy, Portugal, um, the Far East deliberately has been successful because they're all educated in a very different way. So when you look at these projects, um, the nature of their skill and education has been really important in order to make some of these buildings work. So that's been one benefit. The other has been that kind of, there's a natural kind of UN atmosphere in the office. And, and there is, because of that positivity, I think it has helped us to be able to talk in many languages, literally, not just as languages we speak in, but in terms of architects. So we've been able to capture all of the, the, the positions that different architects have from say Thomas Heatherwick to David Chipperfield or whatever. Uh, and we've been able to do that because of this diverse attitude towards taking a challenging uh, position, but also challenging each other all the time. Sometimes when the wrong team is playing football, it's quite difficult in the office. Right, yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you because you mentioned also the power of the digital and um, you have a lot of digitally savvy people uh, that work with you. Um, and so those digital tools and appro uh, approaches really used in Act 2 really show that we can achieve wonderful things structurally when working with these technologically savvy people. Um, how can these technologies and these people also impact society as a whole? It's the beginning of some of those where we're finding, like I showed the air quality and, and bioclimatic um, models that we, that we have developed in-house because um, during COVID, our own office has suffered. We were hit by COVID early and our client has, for example, employed us to censor the building and look at how air quality is, is actually working in what was 
uh, a poster boy for office buildings pre-COVID. So I think that there are there are there is much data to harvest yet, and we are still at the beginning of how we will change and use and adapt that without becoming data uh, scientists. You know, how can an engineer take that and reimagine not only his space but his building and his city? And and we're heading towards that through through some of the biochemistry. I can't show you all the projects, but I can. I, we've done some. Post now recent analysis of some tall buildings we've done to see how the wind actually is not like the wind tunnel test told us it would be. So there are there are there's a lot of work still going on in this area, and I think society will benefit from that. That I I wouldn't pretend that we will go out and uh, some, like some people claim that smart cities are all about uh, putting sensors in everything and putting the city on autopilot. I I don't think that's the case. I think the human being is. Too, too important. Great, thanks. Yeah, I, I I remember also you refused to run a studio by yourself as an engineer at Harvard, at the GSD. Uh, can you let us know a bit why we need to collaborate with these other disciplines to impact projects, people, and work in a larger socioeconomic context? It, you know, it's for me, it's not been rocket science. I, I, I in my life's time, have, um, grown a distaste for those who can do everything, paint, uh, make gravity work, do heat, um, sell art and build buildings and so on and so on. I, I have never found that um, possible because you can't possibly be, do all of those things at their best. But in order to make all of things, those things work at the best, a number of us can come together and frame the questions and then excel in our own part and know when to stop talking about ours and allow the other one an entry point. So the questions that we frame are very different in that sense. And those studios are, are designed like that. Some of them are multi-semester multi so that they in the first semester is the research and then, then it's a, a formal idea about what you might put on the street. So they, they are, um, they couldn't work, they wouldn't produce the kind of work. If I was doing them on my own, they would have long, beautiful arches, great roofs, very tall, thin columns, but not building. That's what they would have because, you know, I, it's a struggle for an engineer to frame the question about society. That's the architect's job. I think we can assist and support and sometimes answer the question and sometimes help him frame the question or her so frame the question. But I do feel that this interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary conversation is pretty important and I'm pretty against the multidisciplinary single force where everybody's in the same room and you're working with an A architect, a B class engineer, a C class mechanical engineer and a D class uh, data scientist. It's better if they're all A's and they can, you can only do that by actually being separate but collaborative. So you can do a transdisciplinary discourse. So that's um, also why you you were teaching the the, the the studio on mass timber with Jennifer in Harvard. And yeah. um, uh, can you maybe say something about the digital layer of prefabrication of mass timber? Uh, does it make a difference for cost, for working conditions, performance, the circular economy, and body carbon? Those those sustainability aspects. Yeah. Well, first of all, part of the reason. Uh, for setting that um, at Harvard, that studio up was to be mischievous because what we wanted to do was really make, make all the world realize timber is not going to solve your problem. It, it is so minute in the bigger problems when you look at those earlier maps of what China's building versus what the rest of us are. If you look at this problem globally, it's not going to solve it. And if it is going to solve it, it's not going to be the manufacturers or the digital technology on its own that 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 is mass timber your clt in particular is promoted like that you know you don't need an architect you just need somebody who makes it and he will assemble it overnight unlike normal buildings these are not true this is just not true so what we were setting up was well what can you do with clt if you think of it um stereotomically or tectonically or the surface or you bring an artist and you challenge yourself to not building more Swedish saunas, but 
try and build something that is beautiful and might fit on sites in the USA. So we actually found sites in the USA, real sites where they're trying to build this building. Um, so I, I, would, uh, I would argue that it is definitely one of the answers, mass timber and CLT, but without getting overly difficult about it, the sequestration argument doesn't happen till 25 years from the moment you build it. Uh, so, so it's actually a bit late down the line. Everybody's talking about build, you know, growing a forest in a minute to build a five-story building, which is roughly what happens in Sweden. But I'm not convinced that it, it is uh, for everyone, nor am I convinced that its best use will, will come only if we talk about its technology, assembly, and its embodied carbon. We have to go beyond that because that's all known now. What do we do and how do we use it? For example, um, the trees in South Africa that actually destroy other trees, which, are, which were imported from Australia hundreds of years ago, need to be cut to actually say, create water in Cape Town because Cape Town dried up because these trees were just sucking the water. So we're now looking at making CLT out of the, that timber which has the potential to explode. So there's you know, interesting research and so on. In Kenya, we're doing the same, looking at CLT that's local. In Colombia, we're looking at how do you make CLT out of potentially bamboo because that's a normal material. So there are all sorts of potentials that can come out of that. But one thing is don't be monomaterial about it and don't, don't think that it's gonna save the world. Great, thanks. I, I'm gonna ask you one more question before I open the floor to, to, to the audience. So don't hesitate to already ask some questions in the chat. Um, I really liked your slide with the, the Prisma with the different um, namings of the discipline and you define yourself as a design engineer. Uh, and often architects and engineers are very separated, even already in school. Um, according to you, where does the profession need to go, especially with the digital changes that we see coming up? Well, with, without any question, it needs to go where, where you are at and MIT are at, where there is, although you're sometimes heavy on the, the architects, I do feel that not uh, only defining people through the scientific knowledge or through the arts knowledge, which you could extremize, let's say, as architecture and, and science. There's a lot of things in between, by the way. I think that somehow we need to bring the schools back to the way they used to be in the 50s, when engineers and architects and makers were all in the same space doing stuff. And this is where the work that the NCCR is doing, I have said it quite openly, is, is, is a marker for what the rest of the world should be thinking about. So I think bringing it all to one's place is, is, is the beginning of the, the way in which it could come out. Of course, not everybody can afford to do that, but it is the way in which I think joined up thinking can come back. Great, thank you very much for those insights. Um, so I wanna encourage everyone who can stay to stay uh, and to ask questions. So either you can raise your hands uh, or click on the icon of the raised hand or just write your question in the chat. Right. Russell, Russell you, you're the first to raise your hand. Yeah, um, honey, if I, I, I got it very early on. So so it uh, my, my question stems from one of your opening statements. You, you talked about um, in your office, you said our input is to know when we are not needed. And then a little bit later, you said, uh, we could not wait for the client or the architect or others to ask the questions. We knew we needed to respond to a problem. And then you went on to say that you did so using digital tools. And th this implies to me that there's a, a, a need for you and your office to be very aware of how you are engaging with your partners. You know, kind of the relationship, and I'm I'm sure that the relationship is not consistent across different partners. Some you probably work with much better. Some you work with less well. Some you very clearly understand their competences, and the converse. Yeah. And and just now you also said that you know you really appreciate this bringing of things together, and that also requires a intrinsic awareness of the capabilities. 
Can, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and maybe also try to link that to these digital tools that you build and maybe talk about how the digital is changing the ability to be aware of what yeah. your partners can do? Yeah, in, in very simple terms, being able to, to see the things others can't see makes things better. So visualization of not just animation, but visualization of data and visualization of where or how something works is all, all a bottom line kind of equation from 15, 20 years ago. Already that kind of moved this forward, but, but then everybody could do it and you could press a button on Autodesk and do it. How can you actually go a bit further? And for that going a bit further portion, if I can explain it using that same project where we did the light analysis, right? We knew that this was, this was an international competition, big competition for a very major railway station that you could knock down. It's Birmingham and lots of trains. And we had to beat Ben Van Berkel, Raphael Vinoli, all sorts of people to win this. So we, we answered the question um, by creating a shiny metal surface on the outside, which is not a Gary idea, you know, not like crumpling paper, but a designed surface that would allow not only the light to shine in a particular way, but lighten the whole of the, the, the city because of the way it brings sun into the city and so on and so on. So to, in order to make that successful, and we had the same incident when we did the Shanghai Expo, because when we first enter the competition, most people haven't imagined what we're likely to show. And when we show it, you have to be convincing that you can actually make it because most of the time you're out at that point, they think, well, these guys are just flying a kite. You know, they're gonna fail day one. But we have learned that, you know, through these collaborations and through potentially having some of our own questions and then landing them at the right moment, particularly in invited competitions, most of our work, by the way, is one through invited competitions. So by now we've reached a level where we're only usually called when there's something difficult to do. So we know that it, there's a lot expected. And I think that these tools not only are about speed, but about manipulation of what it is we want to say, uh, and then what it is we want to deliver. So knowledge of construction through these tools is pretty important. Um, in, in the case for Bloomberg, I, I can you know, another day show you the ramp on the inside that, that Foster's wanted. It's a super complex ramp that we built inside, but it came down to a one millimeter tolerance on something that's um, slightly shorter than the vessel that we did in New York, which also had a one millimeter tolerance. So we, had, we knew already that tolerance was the issue, not which software you will use, but how can they manufacture to that tolerance and then develop the tools to actually allow us to do that. How many pieces do we make? How often, what are the risk components? And we tell that story at the competition stage, usually to, to win or secure the client's confidence. So is there a way that you bring it back to the people though? Yes. The people who are involved. Yes, Birmingham New Street um, was, was a dead city. If you don't know about it, Google it. Most people don't like to go there and it was insecure. It had a huge problem, social problem. And one of our points was about security, safety. That was the winning point, not having to stop any trains. It wasn't just about creating this beautiful surface, but what does that surface do in terms of impacting the user? And it had 1.4 million people go through the, the shopping mall in its first year, which was more than 10 years of foot traffic in the previous years. So there's evidence-based um, you know, data that shows, like Mazda, post-occupancy, that how and what impact has it had on the city? It's right opposite Mikano's um, library in Birmingham, which is quite famous. It kind of transformed the whole city in a way because it's, a, it's the node for, I think every three minutes there's a train that goes through it. So it's a knuckle for going north. So it, a lot of people see it. A lot of people enjoy it. It's become iconic, not like Bilbao, but iconic like, I am not afraid to go in there. I'd like to stop there because there is now a, a, a you know, Smith Klein, or there's an hour a handbag shop that I would like to visit. None of that existed before we did it. And we promised all of that at the competition stage. So there is an impact on people and I can go on, you know, I can sort of describe projects in Rwanda where we've had a different sort of impact, but there is always a weather eye on 
on you know using our technology to improve the quality of life of the other that can be the architect sometimes because he has a dream and he can't make it how can we help him you know so in a way there is a there is an inherent um, chemistry in the office now culture that that looks for this and if we don't generate it for so people leave the company the kids that join us now want this kind of difficult ex excitement okay thank you thank you um lauren i think you raise your hands next uh, first of all thank you for the talk it was very um broad and exciting um i have a few questions when we're talking about the use of let's say natural materials in digital fabrication so for example at the site visit in robotics we've been kind of um, pursuing these robotic workflows where we can handle very unstructured uh, materials, whether they're unstructured from a ge geometry standpoint, uh, such as the rocks, or also very anisotropic, such as bamboo. And when you're talking about wood, you were, you were mentioning that, for example, there's initiatives to take very natural materials, bamboo, and make them into very standardized materials um, because they're more predictable. So I think this question is for engineering, how, when we have developed these processes for from a process perspective, how do you also develop at the same time the engineering methods that um, enable us to still validate the engineering performance of these un unstandardized and anisotropic natural materials um, that rely less on topology or typology and rely less on standardization? So maybe maybe you can. Uh, yes, well, it, it, I know exactly where you're coming from, and, and the found object as as architecture. And now what can you make out of it is, is been a, uh, as I'm sure you know, it's an age old question that we, we haven't, I don't think any of us have managed to solve. And the potential of what I've seen in, uh, in the, uh, the NCCR is the beginnings of actually thinking of it like that. The only dilemma I have is the world is not waiting because we're short of housing, we're short of everything. So if, if, unless, unless that research, as I said, closed the gap in my last section, how can you quickly demonstrate its use transglobally, you know, not, not only in a rich society or a poor society, but how can you demonstrate that this kind of use of um, robots and technology can actually produce? Uh, I, I, I'm kind of saying, gonna say something controversial. I was born in Uganda and when I see the Rwanda, aerodromes, I, I am looking forward to it because as a kid, I used to use the catapult all the time. I will bring the drones down every day with a catapult. So, you know, there are, there are questions in this area that sometimes are not asked or, or answered in the right way. You have to go to these places or to find types yet that, that will actually uh, allow you to frame the questions and close that gap. If you only keep it at a very high level, I think that its use will follow too slow. And then the industry will deliver what you described as standardized. Um, I don't know if that answers your questions, but I think there are ways of doing it. And I think through testing and through automation of testing, we're in a better position now with tools. Some of our geotechnical work, I can do a whole lecture on it. It's, incredible bring one of my geotechnical guys what we managed to do under the ground i wish we could do above the ground in terms of being able to push some of the software and break the rules in the codes of practice all the time in order to invent something um, we're unable to do that codes don't allow it insurance policies don't allow it at this point so i would like you to continue in that area and find a way of closing the gap sooner I think, I think when you said the codes don't don't en enable it, that's what I mean. I think a lot of the calculation methods de depend on something predefined. Yes. You design and then you, you calculate and you verify. But if you design with, or you build with things that you can only test as you build, or you, know, you only know the geometry when you're building them, you can't pre-calculate. So it poses a huge challenge to engineering methodologies where you can't, you have to, you have to calculate as you build, but also have enough risk that you know um, within reason that if you apply the right testing methods after, as you're building it, you can still validate these, these uh, structures that you're building that have a high degree of risk and un unpredictability, let's say. Sure, no, no, I understand that better now. But yeah, the fear the industry will have is you make us redundant very quickly. 
that, that's the risk that you face. But I, I can see where you're coming from. And I see that that could have a lot of potential, like the work, all of the work you guys are doing will inform us in, in, edu in, in construction. But as I said, when I was last there, sadly practice is catching up because it can't wait. You know, it has a tax to pay that year and a rent. So it has to take some, some of the very high end thinking bring it back to a primitive version of it and use it immediately. That's what we're having to do at the moment. So if these tools are, are coming back to the industry faster, I would say that um, there will be more use of this. There is no future without the digital, by the way. So I com completely believe that. Thank you. Thank you. I believe Orkun was up next. Um, thanks, Catherine, and thanks, Hanif um for the lecture i want to ask a broad question concerning um from topic of preservation and the longevity of the of the whole um of the buildings you've shown or uh, um so i'm asking this because we're looking into the topic of uh, the preservation and the repair of high-tech buildings um, at our professorship now and a lot of the buildings you also shown and, and projects you're dealing with has a very sophisticated design uh, idea and a process and a building process behind them. So I'm questioning um, the how are we going to, because one of, most of them will be in terms of the way they were built and technology and architectural value will be monumental or will be preserved or at least will be worth preserving, how we'll be able to preserve them. And uh, because sometimes, just to wrap it up, it be, need they they might need a lot of investment or require like the buildings you've shown from Aro, for example, right? Um, a new idea it becomes challenging. I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, how easy is this to 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 uh, protect them? Well, if I can answer it, um, Orkan, in two ways. One is that it's definitely in the Western society, right? a growing market because there will be more of that than new stuff not just conservation but preserving even buildings that are 30 years old because in historically as catherine knows very well we we, we knock buildings out every 20 25 years we design it in because of the keynesian economic formula otherwise you can't keep people employed you know you've got to knock it down that's changed that attitude has changed so in scale of preservation for example we are doing now uh, the first cast iron multi-story building. They call it the grandfather of tall buildings in Shrewsbury, uh, which is hundreds of years old. It's the first cast iron columns. And what we had to do actually to get access even to it, because it was so unsafe, is use drones. So for example, in a small way, being able to repair and um, protect some of these buildings, the very old ones, and even see some of them close up for the first time without losing life, the te technology is the only way we're able to do it already, right? Same applies to, we're looking at some uh, uh, damaged buildings and, and actually destroyed buildings in Syria right now. We can't go there, but we're having to look at it. We're building in Baghdad right now, and we're only monitoring it with drones and actually you, you can't have people there. So I can see that, Preservation has um, more than one ways of thinking about it. But if you took the immediate problem, the stock of housing and the stock of uh, the Western buildings that are, let's say, from the 60s onwards, most of them can survive despite the fact that they were designed to only last 20, 25 years. Facades are always done like that and we can replace it. But the primary structural systems were, and we're finding that. The, the pile foundations are actually redundant in many of them because they've grown, gained strength. So we could actually add to them and so on and so on. So my answer would be that it's a growing world, it's a growing market. And the more you can demonstrate through real cases, and we had to do that in Shrewsbury with an architect called Phil and Clegg Bradley for the National Heritage with this multi-story building, they came to us and said, this is a national asset what can you do with it? And the first thing was really get in there safely. Now we're redoing it. There's actually a live website you can visit and see it. But what I'm getting at, I guess, is that if you guys were able to find real buildings where you can demonstrate some of your stuff now, rather than 
having to only do it in the lab, it will catch up very quickly because all our clients are looking at longevity. Only now we're working on projects that have a hundred year design life, only now, despite knowing that that's a big question in terms of sustainability, that's the way forward. Thank you. <laughs> One more thing about that, uh, we found some chemicals and uh, actually found a shoe from the Victorian age in that building that we would never have found. So obviously child labor was quite big in that time. So you get this incidental stuff. We found some chemicals that we'd never come across in the mortar, in the brickwork, in that building in Shrewsbury. We still don't know quite why it was there, whether it was accidental or it provided some strength or something. So you, you will only be able to do that with these kind of tools, I think. Great, thank you. Um, Philippe, I think you're up next. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Sonif, uh, very much for this, uh, this talk. I, I think it was insightful beyond what I, what I actually expected. Uh, really, really exciting. Thanks for sharing all of that. Um, my question is, is uh, uh, to you is, uh, to what extent do you think the size of the group of amazing people that you can work with uh, is important to be able to, I mean, so you can present things very convincingly, uh, but I, I just wonder to what extent that is important. So the, the size of an enterprise to be able to really make a difference. Yeah, no, you're right. For example, we are currently employing more structural engineers, structural engineers than anyone else in London. You wouldn't think that because Arabs are 10,000 people and ACOM are 70,000, but they don't believe that structural engineering is a growing market. So they've all turned into project managers and whatever it is else they do. So you're right in that the numbers are important. And we always uh, knew that within the clusters, of structural engineering, we, we have teams that are no more than 12. And that number came up from when we started the practice right at the beginning. And if you see that we always have a, a triple leadership, always, you know, it's been the AK and the T, each with different strength. But the number 12 comes from simple ideas about rules of the game, football, rugby, most of these games you'll see, you can only communicate with about 12 people effectively. Even with Zoom, we're finding Zoom a big problem because young engineers need supervision, need access to elder people or more experienced people. They can't get it the way they used to. So we're suffering. So I would say to you that the, the, our clusters grow from a number 12 and then it goes. So there are 12 people at the most senior level and then 24 people below them. And then within project teams, we try and work with that as a number. We don't behave as 350 people. What we're careful and have learned to do is not put all the Italians in the same team. We just actually mix it up so that there's a deliberate rotation in the office all the time. Because the technical ability of these people from their education and cultural systems, the overlap of different, of different nationalities is much more productive than a singular approach to, to an engineering problem. I hope that helps answer. So cluster of 12 minimum, I would say, and, and figures of 12 that go up. No, that is actually very interesting. What, my question was more um, uh, to what, what a size is of an office in order to have sufficient kind of freedom and, and, and opportunities to, to also do the type of research that you can do through your office as well. So I'm more talking about, um, I mean, an, 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 another example is, for example, at Zahadit Architects. They are large enough that they can afford a group of uh, 10, 12 nerds that are just thinking and doing prototypes. So the code group, for example. Yeah. And there, there's other models like that. So I, I, I wanted to maybe have your, your, your opinion or your thoughts on that, because it okay. seems so, that so you need to have a certain size in order to be able to afford uh, yeah. these, these, these alternatives. Yeah, but uh, Philip, what has happened in that is that we, we agreed at the beginning that we would always have 10% of the income rather than size of, or numbers, always put aside for R&D or research or investment in the company. And that has kept up even when the company grows, right? But the, the important point about that really is being able to 
uh, afford that 10%, you have to be charging more than everybody else to be equal to them. So the nature of our work has grown because of that behavior. Anybody who picks up the phone to AKT knows that they will cost you more than Arabs. So don't call them if you want a cheap job. Yeah. Because we, our model is based on the fact that we will do it our way. We pay high rent where we are, and we have a certain amount of money that we make as profit, certain amount of money that we reinvest in. And we've stuck to that. And after a few years, what has happened is that the best clients and the best architects have seen that as a valuable thing. And they've said, okay, this is, this is theirs, and they, they, we're going to have to pay them what they need to do it. And that's how it works. So we, by that, we lose a lot of work, by the way, in tenders, if we go for tenders. Uh, and, and therefore, we've been very careful about how many projects can actually a 350 strong practice do. Right now, it's a problem because 30% of our work has been international. So we, we are actually struggling to see how do we return to work and do 30% of our work from London internationally. So these are continual conversations in the office, but these simple rules of thumb have, have stuck out from the day we started the practice. Yeah, you can afford 10%, believe me, in any, any practice, no matter how small or big. Okay. No, no, this is great. That's exactly, that's, uh, it's perfect. Great, thank you. I will take one last question before we close this wonderful talk. Um, if, is there anyone else? I see there is one question in the chat. Um, Professor, you mentioned climate emergency. How do you see the future of architecture and the fields of engineering as a whole in a world where economic growth needs, needs to slow down? Well, I, you know, I wish I knew the immediate answer. What I would say is that uh, if architecture and engineering can't move the needle significantly, the world is in trouble because after agriculture, we damage the world more than anyone else. And we're the most productive after agriculture as well. So I always like to say that, uh, in my opinion, engineering um, and architecture in that sense is, is probably the first, not most important art, but it's the first discipline and profession that actually can deal with the problems we're facing. I know that we can argue about the politics, the economists, and those that are dealing with fuel and so on. But in my view, the built environment uh, takes priority. I hope that answers the question. And for that reason, all we need to do is redraw what an architect looks like. That's a wonderful conclusion to end this talk with. Um, thank you so much, Hanif, for your time and for your insights. This was really inspiring. And I just want to invite everyone to unmute themselves so that we can give a round of applause. Yeah. If I can just apologize for talking for too long. But well, where is it? It was there, so interesting that I didn't want to. Uh, remind so if, you if I was there, I can do it in 20 minutes, with, but it's Zoom just kills me. It just No, it was me. definitely worth it to uh, stay a bit longer. Thank you so much for your talk. Oh, thank you for posing the problem because I enjoyed trying to organize how I could still sound sensible and Russell and Philip and everyone else would still respect me when I come there next year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Hanif. Thanks okay, so thank you. For this was fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thanks for inviting me. And thank you also to Catherine for, for moderating and interviewing. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Very much appreciated. Look thank forward for to working me. with you, Catherine, in the future. Me too. Okay, thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you very Bye. much.